Hello and welcome everyone to lecture number 6 on vector space. Uh, in this video, we are going to discuss about some very important theorems uh, on forming of a vector space and some problems on finding the basis and dimension. Okay, so let's get started with our first theorem. It is saying that if alpha 1 to alpha n is a basis of a finite dimensional vector space V over a field F, then any linearly independent set of vectors contains at most n vectors. Okay, so the statement is saying that given a basis which has dimension n, that means n number of elements in the basis, so the dimension of the vector space is n, then any linearly independent set of vectors of that vector space can contain maximum n number of vectors. Okay, like if I take a set of n plus 1 number of vectors from this given vector space is has to be linearly dependent. It can never be independent. But my independent set can be lesser than n also. The size of the set can be less than n also. But the maximum size can be n. Okay. So like for example, if I say I have R3 as a vector space, that means the dimension here is 3. So that means if I take any set S which contains alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4, okay, and I've taken these elements from R3, okay, so I've taken random four elements from R3, there is nothing to check. We can say that from this theorem, 100% this S set is linearly dependent, okay, it can never be independent. Because the independent set can contain at most n vectors. In this case, it can contain at most three vectors and not more than that. So this theorem will be very essential for us uh, while doing the problems. So let's get started with the proof of this theorem. Um, so let me consider, let me give this set a name. So let me say that let S equals to alpha 1, alpha 2, dot, dot, alpha n so this is given that it is a basis of v Achha. now let me consider a set containing random number of vectors okay let me con con consider that t equals beta 1 beta 2 taken up till beta r where I don't know whether my R index is less than N or equal to N or greater than N. I don't know. I have kept it random. So, um, be a subset of the vector space V. So, I have taken random R number of elements from the vector space V. Okay. Now, what I am going to do is, since the S set is a basis, so that means any linear combination of the S set will somehow create the uh, uh, elements of the T set. Achha, let me uh, specify one more thing that the T set I have taken. Okay, let me say that this T is linearly independent. Okay, so I have taken the T set in this manner. Uh, containing r number of vectors and I am considering that it is linearly independent so that means what I want to prove is that this set can have at most n number of vectors that means my proof here stands like this that I want to show that the index r has to be less or equals to n this is what I want to prove okay this is what I want to prove so if I'm able to show that this R index is less or equals to N, that means the T set, which is a randomly taken linearly independent set, contains at most N vectors. Okay. Achha. So now I will use replacement theorem, which I've done in my previous lecture. For using uh, replacement theorem, I will try to replace the vectors in the S in the basis by the vectors in the T set. Okay. So, uh, let beta 1 equals, now since uh, 
uh, this is a basis so I can express beta 1 as a linear combination I can express beta 1 as a linear combination of the elements of s so let beta 1 equals c1 alpha 1 plus c2 alpha 2 plus dot dot cn alpha n where ci belongs to field for all i 1 to n okay Achha. now here since the set T is linearly independent, I, it cannot be possible that the elements are null elements. That means none of the beta i's can be equal to theta. Okay. So I must have that all the beta i's are not equal to theta for all i 1 to n. Now this is something that is definitely going to happen. So we are not writing that. But this is something you need to keep in mind because any set which contains the theta element it can never be linearly independent it will automatically become linearly dependent okay an independent set can never contain a, a theta element now if you are thinking how that's possible that's something you need to think if you're unable to do it you can let me know okay so now since uh, the t set does not contain the theta element that means none of the beta i are equal to theta so that means this beta 1 is not equals to theta so that means all the constants can never be zero if all the constants are zero then beta 1 will be equal to theta which is not possible okay so here i need to mention that where at least one ci must be non zero Okay, because if all of them are becoming zero, then beta one will be equal to theta, which is not possible since beta one is taken from a set which is linearly independent. Okay, so I can apply replacement theorem here by replacement theorem. We have already done replacement theorem in the previous lecture. what we do in replacement theorem corresponding to the non-zero constant that we have got here we are considering ci not equal to zero that means we are interested in the element ci alpha i over here there is some ith element corresponding to which we have ci alpha i so if the ci is non-zero then we can replace the alpha i in the basis by the vector beta one right this was the simple statement of replacement theorem so by replacement theorem i can say that let's say let me give a name s1 the elements alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha i minus 1 replacing the alpha i element by the beta 1 so comma beta 1 alpha i plus 1 and continuing up till alpha n so by replacement theorem i can say that this s1 set will be the new basis of v uh, s1 is the new basis of v now i will continue this process on and on now again i will try to replace now the element beta 2 okay i have already replaced beta 1 uh, with one of the elements in the s set now i'll try to replace beta 2 with one of the elements in the s1 set that i have got so i will now try to replace beta 2 with one of the elements here then after that is done i will try to replace beta 3 with the new basis after that is done i'll try to replace beta 4 with the new basis and i'll continue this process so let me do the process manually two times then i will say that proceeding similarly okay so now i can say that um let beta 2 equals to now since this is a new basis so that means i can express beta 2 as a linear combination of s1 so beta 2 equals to let's say d1 alpha 1 plus d2 alpha 2 uh, plus uh, d uh, i minus 1 alpha i minus 1 plus d i beta 1 plus uh, d i plus 1 alpha i plus 1 plus d n beta sorry alpha n right so i have expressed beta 2 as a linear combination of the elements of s1 okay 
now again i can say that since beta 2 is definitely non zero so all the constants are non zero okay all the constants d1 d2 up till dn all of them are non zero but more specifically i can say that where at least one di is non zero for i equals 1 to uh, up till i minus 1 then again proceeding from i plus 1 going up till n that means we are saying that this beta 2 this expression where at least one of the constants is non zero among these constants d1 d2 di minus 1 di plus 1 and going up till dn we are not talking about the dith element okay because we are not very much interested in that because i don't want to further replace beta 1 again by beta 2 i want to replace a new alpha element by the beta 2 so we are not in very much interested in that element so here we are claiming that uh, so this is basically a claim okay so i should say that um, we assert we assert that at least one of the constants which i have circled are non zero okay because see uh, why i can consider this if all of them become zero then a problem will happen because if uh, all these di's are zero that means if di equals d1 equals d2 equals up till di minus 1 equals skipping the dith element equals going up till dn if all of them become equal to zero then see what problem will happen from this line i can write beta 2 equals to so all the red circles have become zero so what we have is beta 2 is equals to di beta 1 right rest of the things have become zero now this is a problem why because you can see in the very first line of the question we had considered the t set containing all the beta elements to be linearly independent so if all the beta elements are linearly independent then how is it possible that beta 2 can be expressed as a linear combination of beta 1 that means the beta set is becoming linearly dependent so that's a contradiction so that means this is a contradiction since the t set is linearly independent the t set means the set containing all the beta elements okay so therefore the assertion that i have made over here that uh, these particular elements which i have circled that these particular elements one of them has to be non-zero let me consider that uh, among these circle elements there is some d suffix j which is non-zero because d suffix i has already been taken so i'm taking let d suffix j is non-zero uh, sorry so let me consider that let d suffix j is not equals to zero that means now i can replace beta 2 by i can replace alpha j element the uh, element corresponding to the dj index will be alpha j so i can replace the alpha j element by beta 2 and form a new basis using replacement theorem so let dj not equals to zero then by replacement theorem let me create a new set which is alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha j minus 1 in place of the alpha j element i am replacing it with the beta 2 element so here comes in beta 2 then again continuing from alpha j plus 1 and going on in this manner up till alpha i minus 1 then in the alpha ith element i already had got beta 1 then continuing from alpha i plus 1 and going on up till alpha n so that means this new s2 is going to be the new basis of 
v so which is the new basis of v so you can understand that we can now proceed similarly now among the, these elements which i'm circling over here alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha j minus 1 alpha j plus 1 alpha i minus 1 alpha i plus 1 up till alpha n that means in i'm not using the betas the alpha elements that i have i will again replace beta 3 with one of these elements and form a new basis then again among the remaining alphas i'll replace it with the beta 4 and the process will go on okay so now I will say that proceeding similarly, proceeding similarly, we will obtain or I would say we may encounter the following situations okay now the following things may hap happen now since i don't know the index r okay i had taken t set to be beta 1 beta 2 up till beta r and i was not sh i did not know that what is the value of r whether it is less than n greater than n equals to n i don't know but just keep one thing in mind my target of proof is r less or equals to n this is what i want to show at most the number of beta elements can be maximum n or less but not more than n that's what i want to show okay so now the following situations are may and we may encounter the following situations that i am one by one replacing the alpha elements with the beta elements so it may happen that all the beta i's replace the alpha i's and the t set is exhausted that means what i want to say is that r is strictly less than n that while the replacement is happening the t set containing all the beta elements have exhausted and all the alpha i's have been replaced and some alpha i's are still remaining okay so that means r less than n so in that case we would have the basis let's say the basis i'm representing it by a uh, um, s dash um, it would look something like beta 1 beta 2 going on up till beta r so all the beta r's have come inside the new basis and the remaining elements are alpha r plus 1 alpha r plus 2 alpha n okay Achha, now this is something we don't want to write okay i am just writing this so that i can explain it better actually the problem in this statement what i have written just now is that it may happen that alpha r plus 1th element has been replaced by some beta and the alpha rth element was not replaced it may happen that the alpha nth element was replaced by beta 1 and the alpha 1th element was never replaced so we are not sure which element has been replaced by which element so we shouldn't write it in this way but just for the sake of understanding i'm writing that maybe all the beta elements have come inside the alpha set and some alpha elements are still remaining okay that means alpha r is less than n but it is better not to write in this format so i'll just erase this it was just for the sake of understanding so what i'm trying to say that all the beta i's have replaced the alpha i's and the t set has exhausted that means r less than n so this is one possible scenario so this possible scenario actually uh, is fine with our proof we want to show r less or equals to n we have got r less than n the second uh, situation we may encounter is all the beta i's have uh, replaced alpha i's and both t and s are exhausted that means in this situation all the alpha i's have replaced uh, 
uh, all the beta eyes have replaced the alpha eyes and neither the alpha eyes are remaining and nor the beta eyes are remaining in the T set all have been successfully replaced that means this is the scenario where R is equals to N so all the beta uh, beta eyes have come inside the S set and now there is no extra betas remaining and no extra alphas remaining exactly the index have matched so this is again another possible scenario and this again uh, supports our claim that R has to be less or equals to N so both 1 and 2 actually support our proof okay we don't have any issues with 1 and 2 but now we are saying that the next situation will never happen that is it may never happen that um, all that uh, sum of the beta i's replace or I should say exhaust um, replace and exhaust the entire S set that means what I'm trying to say that R greater than N this situation will never happen now why it will never happen I'm going to explain that so I'm trying to say here that all the betas will rip not all the betas some of the betas just a few collection of the beta elements is replacing all the uh, alpha elements and some betas are still remaining which have not replaced the alphas because the beta elements are more in number and the alphas are less in number okay so this situation may never happen that some of the beta is replaced and exhaust the entire s set so why this may never happen now we are going to the explanation of that so um, imagine that uh, let uh, so I should start my sentence in this way um, this is not possible since if s dash equals beta 1 beta 2 uh, dot dot beta n that means these beta 1 I was uh, one by one replacing with the beta 1 element beta 2 element like this I have replaced all the alpha i element by the beta i and I'm calling that s dash mm, if this is the new basis and beta n plus 1 beta n plus 2 up till beta r um, are elements of the vector space v that means these elements have replaced all the alpha elements so alpha 1 was replaced by this alpha 2 was replaced by this and alpha n was replaced so alpha 1 to alpha n were replaced by these elements in some random order it's not necessary that alpha 1 is replaced by beta 1 maybe alpha 1 was replaced by beta n like that in a haphazard manner but somehow all the alpha 1 to alpha n are replaced by beta 1 to beta n and the remaining beta elements are uh, have not been used and they are just simply some elements of v okay so now you can imagine that if this is the vector space v my s dash set is a basis okay, so this is my s dash set which is the basis okay and beta n plus 1 is some element of the vector space beta n plus 2 and like this beta r these are all some elements of the vector space which have not been included in the basis okay now since s dash is a basis so some linear combination of s can create the beta n plus 1 element similarly some linear combination can create the remaining elements so I can say that this implies um, beta n plus 1 beta n plus 2 and like this up till beta r uh, are linear combinations or I should say can be expressed as
can be expressed as linear combinations of the elements of s dash right so just using basis property i can say that is some linear combination of s dash can create the elements which are lying outside the basis in the vector space right but this is a contradiction to the fact that all the beta i's starting from beta 1 up till beta r all the beta i's were linearly independent if beta n plus 1 can be expressed as a linear combination of beta 1 to beta n that means the beta set is not linearly independent it is dependent so if any of the beta can be expressed as the linear combination of beta 1 to beta n it is contradicting the fact that the entire beta set was originally linearly independent so this is a contradiction to the fact that um, t the set containing all the beta was t the t is linearly independent so this situation will never arise that r greater than n this situation will never arise and we have just proved that so we have just mentioned what are the possible scenarios we will encounter the possible scenarios are these two which is r less than n or r equals to n and together if we combine them then we get that r is less or equals to n right so our roman 1 and roman 2 which are the two situations which are arising it is giving rise to r less or equals to n which was the required proof of this theorem okay so this is a very important theorem and we need to keep the result in our mind that if i have a basis whose dimension is n then from that vector space any linearly independent set can have maximum n number of vectors which is the dimension of the vector space and not more than that it can have lesser number of elements linearly independent elements than n but it cannot have anything more than n so anything more than n will 100 percent will become linearly dependent so this concept will be very important now in this theorem it is saying that if v is a vector space of dimension n over a field f then any linearly independent so the word any is important any linearly independent set of n vectors of v will form a basis of v so that means we already know that some for something or some set to form a basis there are two requirements the first one is that particular set has to be linearly independent if i call that set to be s then it has to be linearly independent and that set has to generate the entire vector space so these were the two requirements for a set to be a basis okay so now we are replacing the second one okay we are replacing the second criteria by saying that we don't require this criteria instead our new second criteria is um any uh, the set s if this contains n number of vectors so i would represent it in this way that the cardinality of the set s if that is equals to the dimension of the vector space then these two would qualify to become the two new properties of a basis okay so basically with the help of the first one and the second one we can create the original property which is ls equals to v okay so let's try to prove this theorem okay so let me construct a set which contains n number of linearly independent vectors okay where n is the dimension of the vector space so let me consider that the set alpha 1 to alpha n obviously which is containing n number of vectors is linearly independent okay so my target is now to show that s is a basis because i've taken a linearly independent set and my set contains n number of vectors which is equals to the dimension of the vector space okay 
so i will try to show that s is a basis all right uh, so let me just draw a diagram here that if this is my vector space v i have constructed a set s now i am taking an arbitrarily ele chosen element from the vector space v so let me take that let beta belongs to v be arbitrarily chosen okay now two things can happen whenever i'm choosing beta arbitrarily either it can happen that beta is outside the s set or maybe beta is inside the s set because i am choosing beta arbitrarily so initially in case number 1 let me consider that beta is not one of the elements of the s set it is lying outside the s set okay so let me consider this thing is happening so case 1 let beta not equals to i want to say that beta does not belongs to s and the elements of s are something like this so i'm saying that beta is not equals to any of the alpha i's for i equals to 1 to n that means beta is not same as any of the elements of s so that means beta is lying outside the s set okay now i am taking another new set okay let t equals to alpha 1 alpha 2 up till alpha n and i am including beta in that set so this is basically the set s union with the element beta so i've taken this new set now how many elements does the t set contain over here i can see n number of elements and one new element beta so obviously t is containing n plus 1 number of elements okay so where t contains n plus 1 one elements now we have already done in the previous theorem just now that any set which contains more vectors than the dimension of the vector space here the dimension of the vector space is n and t is containing n plus 1 elements i told you before in the previous theorem that the moment a set contains more number of elements than the dimension the set becomes linearly dependent and that's 100% guaranteed right so here i can say that this implies t is linearly dependent okay now i can use the condition for linear dependency okay i can say that therefore there exists uh, ci belongs to f for i equals 1 to n plus 1 such that um uh, i can say Mm, c1 alpha 1 plus c2 alpha 2 plus dot dot uh, cn alpha n uh, plus cn plus 1 uh, beta is equals to theta okay so there exists some constants such that this relation being satisfied and if the set is linearly dependent then i can say that at least one of the constants is non zero um so i should have mentioned it in the first place um there exists at least one ci not equals to 0 uh, and obviously belonging to field for i equals to 1 to n plus 1 such that this relation is satisfied right now here we know that at least one of the constants is non zero but i am asserting that specifically the cn plus 1 is non zero okay specifically the cn plus 1 is non zero now why am i asserting i'll just prove that okay so we assert cn plus 1 is not equal to zero okay now what would happen if cn plus 1 equals to zero a problem would have happened let's see what would be the problem if cn plus 1 is equals to 0 okay then this would imply so if the cn plus 1 is becoming 0 then this relation would look something like this c1 alpha 1 c2 alpha 2 plus dot dot cn alpha n equals theta because cn plus 1 has become 0 and as we have already told that at least at least one of the ci must be non zero 
since cn plus 1 has become 0 so that means any one of the remaining ci's has to be non zero at least one has to be non zero because the initial relation was linearly dependent right so where at least one ci not equals to zero for i equals to 1 to n right but now this is a problem to our basic initial starting point okay if this thing is happening then these this thing is happening based on the elements alpha 1 alpha 2 to alpha n which is the elements of the s set and this implies that s set is linearly independent okay so, so this is a contradiction since i have already taken that my s set is linearly independent i have already taken that so this is a contradiction right so from here i can say that it contradicts that s is linearly independent okay so we have got a contradiction so that means my assertion was correct okay i had asserted that cn plus 1 is non zero right so from here i can say that therefore uh, cn plus 1 is not equal to 0 because if cn plus 1 is becoming 0 then a contradiction is happening right now we know that whenever a constant is non zero its inverse is going to exist so this implies that cn plus 1 inverse uh, belongs to field such that um, the element cn plus 1 multiplied with the element cn plus 1 inverse would give us the element 1 the multiplicative inverse right so now i am going to start off from this relation i am going to multiply cn plus 1 inverse with the entire relation on lhs and on the rhs okay so i am going to multiply cn plus 1 and i'm cn plus 1 inverse so i'll have something like this cn plus 1 inverse c1 alpha 1 plus cn plus 1 inverse c2 alpha 2 plus cn plus 1 inverse cn alpha n and cn plus 1 multiplied with cn plus 1 inverse would become 1 so uh, plus beta and theta multiplied with cn plus 1 inverse remains theta right so I multiplied with cn plus 1 inverse now let me keep beta on one side okay i'm keeping beta element on one side rest everything else i'm taking it on the rhs part so minus cn plus 1 inverse c1 alpha 1 minus cn plus 1 inverse uh, c2 alpha 2 and like this up till uh, minus cn plus 1 inverse cn alpha n okay let me give these constants a new name okay let me call them uh, let's say d1 d2 like that so i would have beta equals to d1 alpha 1 plus d2 alpha 2 plus like this uh, dn alpha n okay so from this relation i can see that beta is a linear combination of the elements alpha 1 to alpha n that means beta is a linear combination of the elements of the capital s set right so this implies beta is a linear combination of the elements of s right so this means beta uh, I had taken beta from where had I taken beta? I had taken beta arbitrarily from the vector space, right? So remember, I have taken beta arbitrarily. So that means beta belongs to the vector space taken arbitrarily, implying that, achha, uh, beta I have taken arbitrarily from the vector space, but specifically not from the S set, right? So let me do that specific case before I come on to this generalized statement so for now just remember this statement that we have got okay let's call this statement number one 
and let me go back to the second possibility where my second possibility was I could have taken beta equals to one of the SI right beta was initially not equals to alpha i so now I'm going to take beta from inside the S set and then I'm going to make a generalized statement okay and so again now let me go back to this uh, scenario that uh, let beta equals to alpha i for some i equals 1 to n okay Achha, if beta is equals to any of the alpha i then obviously i can write something like this that 0 times alpha 1 0 times alpha 2 up till 0 times alpha i minus 1 plus 1 times alpha i plus again 0 times alpha i plus 1 and going on up till 0 times alpha n. So you can see basically I have written this line I have written in this way that beta is ultimately equals to alpha i rest all the coefficients have taken 0. So that means again from this relation I can write the same statement that beta is a linear combination of the elements alpha 1, alpha 2 up till alpha n, right? So beta is again a linear combination of the elements of S as well when I'm dealing with case number 2. So again this would imply that beta is a linear combination, I'm writing it as LC, linear combination of the elements of S, right? Uh, so let's call this number 2 so the same thing is happening in both the cases case number case number Roman 1 and case number Roman 2 also so now I can make a generalized statement okay so using 1 and 2 now the generalized statement which I can make is beta when taken arbitrarily from the vector space V does not matter whether it belongs to S or does not belongs to S because I have done it for both the cases implies that beta is a linear combination of the elements of S now what is the meaning of this linear uh, combination of the elements of S that means beta is belonging to the linear span of S right this thing means uh, the linear span correct so beta belonging to vector space is implying beta belongs to L of S so that means the vector space V is a subset of the L of S set right so let's call this number 3 okay Achha. similarly now I can say that um, the elements of S okay the elements of S are all taken from the vector space that's quite obvious so we have a subset of V okay so that's by default that we have S subset of V so if I take L on both sides okay so L of S that would be subset of now remember this property A subset of B implies A sub uh, L of A subset of L of B now I had told you before in one of my previous lectures that if B is itself a vector space then L of B is same as B right L of any vector space is the vector space itself it does not change right so L of S is subset of so there is no point writing L of V it's the same as the vector space V right so that's number 4 so combining 3 and 4 I can say from 3 and 4 I can say that L of S is equals to V and you can see this was the missing property of a basis that we were trying to figure out okay so we had already taken s is linearly independent and now we have got l of s is equals to v which is the second criteria of basis right so we have got that therefore s is linearly independent this we had already taken before and at the same time we have got ls is equals to v so together we can say that s is a basis of v okay and hence the theorem is proved okay so this is a very very important theorem and will be highly used while doing the problems so just remember the statement of this theorem 
that if the dimension of a linearly independent is the dimension of a vector space is matching the number of elements in a linearly independent set taken from that vector space then that set is definitely going to become a basis you don't have to check for this property okay this property is automatically happening it's it's becoming inbuilt right in a similar fashion i can make another i can make another statement that just in the previous one i told that s is linearly independent and this was number 1 and number 2 was um dimension uh, the cardinality of the s set matches the dimension of the vector space then this two is implying that s is a basis okay so we have just done this theorem now i am saying an additional one an alternative version actually uh what would happen if i don't say s is linearly independent like if i say that the cardinality is matching okay the second property remains same that the cardinality of the s set is matching the dimension okay and instead of saying that s is linearly independent if i say that ls is equals to v then also we can say that s is a basis okay so it is not required the linearly independent property instead of that i can say ls equals to v and along with that the same second property which is the cardinality of s is equals to the dimension then also s would form a basis okay so now let's go to a few problems now let's take a look at this problem it is saying that prove that this set containing three vectors is a basis of r3 okay so we are just going to use the properties that we have mentioned just now you can see what is the cardinality of the s set the cardinality is we have total three elements right so the cardinality of the s set is 3 and what's the dimension of r3 the moment i've written r3 obviously its dimension is 3 so dimension of r3 that's 3 so we have cardinality of the set is equals to dimension of r3 so all we need to do is that if we are able to show that along with this s is linearly independent so these two things this was number 1 and this was number 2 that s is linearly independent and cardinality is equal to the dimension which is the thing which i wrote over here right so if that is happening then directly i can say s is the basis of r3 over here so all i need to prove is that whether this is happening or not whether s is linearly independent or not now remember i told you that if the cardinality like in one of my lectures quite back in uh, well, lecture number 2 most probably one or two i had told you that if the um, cardinality of the set and the number of elements in each of the elements number of uh, like um, uh, here uh, if i consider this as a cartesian then i have a uh, um, l three dimensional coordinate over here so the dimension is three dimensional i have three vectors and each having three uh, elements over there so if that is matching then we can directly take a determinant if the determinant value is non zero then it is linearly independent and if the determinant value is zero then it is linearly dependent right so we are going to use that shortcut way so i am going to take the determinant 2 1 1 which is the first element 1 2 1 and 1 1 2 right we could take the determinant because the cardinality is matching with the number of elements in each of the particular element right if this was a four dimensional coordinate and we had three elements then it was not possible to take the determinant then we have to go by the traditional way where we would take c1 alpha 1 plus c2 alpha 2 plus dot 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 equals to theta and check whether the constants are zero or non zero okay that would have been the traditional way but this is faster when the cardinality is matching right so i'll just take the determinant of this uh, although i know it's going to be non zero but still i'll just find that out Uh, so it's going to be four minus one minus one times two minus one plus one times uh, one minus two. So that's three into two six one minus one 
minus 1 so that's 4 which is non-zero right so I have got the determinant is non-zero so automatically I can say that s is forming a basis of r3 using the properties that we have just deduced correct okay so let's go to another question it's saying that find the basis and dimension of the subspace w of r3 where w is defined in this manner now how is this problem different from the previous one in the previous one we knew that the dimension of our vector space is 3 we knew from beforehand because it was r3 but now here the problem is we have to show that we have to find the basis of w which is a subspace of r3 we know that the dimension of r3 is 3 but we don't know anything about the dimension of w although we can know using shortcut tricks but as per the question we don't know what is the subs what is the cardinality or what is the dimension of w and hence we don't know what should be the cardinality of our s set which has to form a basis okay although later on i'll tell you how to look at the set construction and directly understand what's the dimension of w we can directly understand that but i'm coming to that a little bit later after i do this sum okay Achha. so how to deal with this kind of sum in a traditional way uh, let's take an arbitrary element from w okay let's say that mm, sorry uh, let um, alpha or let's say eta belongs to w uh, and i would define eta in this manner where eta is equals to a b c okay obviously it has to be a three dimensional coordinate and you can see the moment i take a three dimensional coordinate and it belongs to w it has to satisfy this property that the sum of the elements has to be zero so um, and i have to mention that the sum of the elements a plus b plus c has to be zero okay now from this equation always try to eliminate the maximum number of variables you can so one from one equation you can definitely uh, eliminate just one variable not more than that obviously so from here you can find uh, let's say i'm eliminating c so i can say c is minus a minus b so i'll just substitute that back over here so i'll have eta equals a b and instead of c i have minus a minus b correct from here i'm taking a common if i take a common there's a, a over here so that's going to become one that is no a in the second position so that means zero i cannot take anything common from there anything related to a i cannot take common from the third place the coefficient of a is minus one so a minus one is going to be there now i'm taking the b l b common in the first first position i don't have any b so that's going to be a zero the second position has one b so that's going to be a one the third position has minus one coefficient of b so that's going to be a minus one right so you can just add up these two and check you're getting the previous line right Achha. now let's give some names to this element and this element okay let me say that let alpha equals 1 0 minus 1 and beta equals 0 1 minus 1 okay and let me put them inside a set and let me say that s contains the set elements alpha and beta where alpha and beta are defined by these two elements okay now can you observe that these two elements are definitely linearly independent when you're dealing with two elements you don't have to go by definition or determinant anything just observation will give you the answer can you multiply any constant with the first element and get the second one or vice versa it's never possible you cannot multiply anything with the first element and get the second one because you can see the position of zero has changed so you if you multiply anything with the first element the zero position is going to remain in the middle always but it has shifted over here in the first position so anything multiplied with alpha will not give you beta so therefore they are not linearly dependent they are 100 percent linearly independent okay so we he can say that here s is linearly independent that's our first observation we have to show that we are trying to show that s is a basis okay remember that in whenever we do a problem in this manner the two elements that we get or whatever number of elements that we get over here in these positions they are going to form the basis okay that's the simple funda Achha. so 
to form a basis we have shown that it is linearly independent now the second thing we want to show that s is going to generate the vector space okay here we are talking about the vector space w okay so s is going to generate the w uh, vector space okay so let's try to do that mm. uh, so we are trying to show that l of s is going to be equal to w right so how do we show these kind of things we have to show ls subset of w and we have to show uh, w subset of ls and then combine these two to get that and then we can say that s is forming a basis right now in order to show something like this we have to take a random element let's say j from this set and show that j belongs to the set l of s then we can show w is subset of ls right so let's say that let j belongs to w so this would imply that j looks something like let's say p q r okay where uh, the moment it belongs to w it has to satisfy the condition of w which is some of the elements has to be non zero okay now from here the same calculation is going to happen always remember in this kind of sums the same calculation i'm going to repeat the same calculation it was done with abc now i'm just doing it with p q r the same same calculation okay so from here i'll eliminate one of the elements i'll eliminate r so that's going to be minus p minus q so then i'm going to write uh, j uh, as p q in place of r minus p minus q right so then i can take p common and get 1 0 minus 1 i'll take q common and write uh, 0 1 minus 1 we had named these elements alpha and beta so i can say that j is equals to p times alpha plus q times beta right so from this relation you can see that j is a linear combination of the elements of alpha and beta so from here i can say j is a linear combination of the elements of capital s set right now i had taken j from where i had taken j from w right i have taken j from w so therefore i have got that j taken from w implies j belongs to now j is a linear combination of the elements of s now what does that mean that means that j belongs to l of s right so j belongs to w implies j belongs to l of s so w subset of l of s the thing which i was talking about j taken from w j belonging to l of s that has happened so w subset of l of s let's call this point number a okay now i need to show the above part which is l of s subset of w that's the easy part actually okay you can already see that s containing the elements alpha and beta okay i'll explicitly write the alpha element alpha was 1 0 minus 1 and beta was 0 1 minus 1 now the way we have constructed alpha and beta it's definitely going to satisfy the properties of w what was the property of w adding all the three elements will give you zero right you add up the three elements it's going to give you zero you add up the three elements it's going to give you zero so definitely alpha and beta are elements of w okay so the set s where all these are elements of w so therefore s is a subset of w right because alpha belongs to w and beta belongs to w so s is subset of w so that would imply so i have got that s subset of w so that means ls subset of now again no point writing l of w because w is a vector space so l of w means the w set itself because w is a sub vector space so that would be my point number b so from a and b i can say that ls is equals to w right so from a and b i would say ls equals w and that's my number 2 okay so my number one point was s is linearly independent that was my point number 1 and point number 2 i have got that 
L of S is equals to W. So basically the two properties of basis. Okay. So from 1 and 2, S is a basis of W. And the question also said that find the dimension of W. So therefore, dimension of W is now how many elements does S contain? Look at the S set. It contains two elements alpha and beta. All right. So its dimension is 2. So dimension of W is 2. And that's the answer. Right. Now I will tell you a easy way to understand what's the dimension of W by just looking at the question. You don't even have to solve anything. Okay. So just look at this question and see the number of equations involved, independent equations. Remember this, independent equations. Here you have only one equation. So one equation is definitely independent. It's not dependent on anything. So if you have just one equation, okay, one equation involving however, how many number of variables does not matter. Okay, involving the three variables, two variables, one variable does not matter. You have one equation. Now, what's the dimension of the original vector space? Now, W was a subspace. The original vector space was R3. Its dimension was, dimension of R3 is definitely 3. You have one equation. So, dimension of W would be dimension of R3 minus the number of independent equations you have over here. You have one independent equation. So, dimension of W is going to be 2. And that's what we have got. Okay. Now you will have a question, what do I mean by independent equations? Just take a look at this question, a similar question. Okay, I just have now two equations. Okay, now the moment you have two equations, now think, are these two equations independent? That means if you multiply some constant with the first equation, will you get the second one? No, that's not happening in this case if you observe. Okay, if you multiply anything with the first equation, you're never going to get the second one. So that means they are two independent equations. So now if I asked you directly, what would be the dimension of W? You know dimension of R3 is 3, right? So dimension of W, that's going to be 3 minus 3 from the dimension of R3 minus the number of independent equations. How many independent equations? Two independent equations. So minus 2, that would be 1. So dimension of W would be 1. Okay, now try to think what would be uh, two set of equations which are not independent. Just now try to take this example that I had 2x plus 4y plus 2z equals to 0. If this was my somehow, if this was my second equation you can see that the first equation multiplied by 2 will give you the second equation. So that means they are not independent. Okay. It's just the first equation written in a different manner. So here you have to ask yourself, so how many independent equations are there? So this equation is absolutely irrelevant because just the first one multiplied with 2 would give you the second one. So you would basically have only one independent equation. In that case, your dimension would be 3 minus 1. That would be 2. So although you have two equations visible to you, that does not mean they are independent. You have to check whether they are independent or not. Ultimately, the number of independent equations you have, you subtract it from the original vector space, which is R3 in this case, and you get the dimension of the subspace. Okay. So this is the concept. Now, I'll just bring back the original question. Okay. So this was the original question. So you can try this question. I've already told you what will be the dimension. The dimension will be one. The basis finding, you can just do it like the previous sum. If there is any problem, you can let me know in the comment section. I'll definitely try to help you out. Thank you. See you in the next lecture.